want to start out with uh, to tell you a little bit of a story about a job I had. So it was back in 2017, and I just switched jobs to find a place that I enjoyed a bit more. I was working before at Booking.com, and it was a little bit too big for me, so I wanted to switch to a, uh, to a startup. And five months later, I also left that job. Um, so the reason of that was a few days before I quit my job, I was speaking at a different conference. It was uh, one in Germany, a uh, JavaScript conference. Um, and I was speaking there, and a few of my colleagues came along. And at one point during the second day of the conference, I heard that someone broke the code of conduct. Um, he was, he told one of the female speakers there that with what she was wearing, she was asking for it. I don't know what it was, but it's probably not something good. Um, so later I heard that that person was my boss. That was something I did not expect from him because he was very friendly and very talking about diversity and everything. Um, so when the crew of that conference tried to speak to him, uh, he became very angry. And he told the crew that the, that the next time, the next year, he would be on that stage and talk to them about what equality really means. No, that's OK. Yes, it's supposed to be black. <laughs> I just have my nose here. And that's <laughs> So um, I didn't speak to him at the conference anymore. Um, so all the, all the things that I heard was from someone else. But he did leave some messages on our, our company's WhatsApp group because he didn't believe in Slack, so he just did WhatsApp. Uh, but that's all the things that he said corroborated the story. Um, so a female colleague of mine decided to speak to him the Monday after. But uh, we actually already knew what we wanted to do, so we already wrote our letter of resignation. But even after speaking to him, the, the story only became worse and worse. So to him, equality meant that everybody should be exactly the same as him. That you leave your beliefs and your religions outside of, your, of the office and be completely neutral. Because that is what he believed that he was, completely neutral. So as a lot of people might have done in our situation is that we left that job. Uh, and luckily, we, bought, we found something else pretty quickly. And this isn't the first time that I left my job because of the atmosphere, um, or because of my colleagues, or because I didn't really feel part of the company. I actually rarely left the job because I didn't like the work. And I think that happens to a lot of people in tech, even if they don't really realize it. Uh, people are switching jobs constantly, and they don't feel welcomed within, the, uh, within their environment. They feel excluded, or maybe even worse, are bullied or harassed. Uh, but for me, keep switching com uh, jobs, I don't think it's going to solve any problems, and I want to try to make it better. I want to try to make it awesome for everyone. So this is the, talk of my, the topic of my presentation. So it's... I cannot do anything more than that, because otherwise the YouTube gods will block the talk. <laughs> so um, I'm a senior software engineer at Confer. That means something completely different to me than it probably does for you, because I'm a front-end developer. Um, I'm also a designer, sort of. Uh, I've, been, I've been doing development for about 12 years now, and I've worked at a bunch of different companies. And I've seen good and bad examples of teamwork and inclusivity, but mostly a lot of bad examples. And I decided to take these experiences that I have and see what I can do to avoid falling into the same patterns uh, and to find ways to improve it. In the 1950s, a journalist, William H. White, said, the great enemy of communication we find is the illusion of it. And what he meant by it is that people have tried to improve communication in the workforce. And they tried to find a way to show that it has improved. They documented whatever was said in meetings, and they tried to make sure that everyone was in the loop of everything. But he realized that that is just an illusion. It's sort of a paper trail of fake improvements. And he also said, we have not talked enough. Uh, we have talked enough, but have not actually listened. And especially, we haven't listened to those people that need understanding. 
Our problems with listening to each other and our lack of compassion and our inability of understanding isn't just caused by lack of communication on the work floor. A study of, uh, by the Harvard Business Review showed that many leaders assume that they are valuing uh, diversity, they assume that they are better at valuing diversity than they actually are. They think, that, they think that they value diversity and inclusivity, while a lot of them are solely uh, using diversity to get recognition themselves, so to show the outside world how diverse they actually are. So I'm saying the great enemy of inclusivity we find is the illusion of it. Because it's not that hard to count the percentage of women or people of color in your organization, but just showing data about hiring and promoting diverse candidates, it doesn't make your company the most welcoming for the people there. It's more about building a climate of trust and appreciation and also openness to differences in thought styles and backgrounds. Now, most of you here are probably not managers at big companies. So you might think that you have little influence in the inclusivity of your company. But um, you are part of the company. And you can be an awesome coworker who's welcoming and make sure that everyone feels included. But before I start telling you how you can do that, I want to take a little bit of a step back and see how the culture we have it now, how it became that way. Because in the beginning of computer science, men focused a lot on building hardware, while women pioneered software development. And arguably, one of the most uh, famous software pioneers is Grace Hopper. She programmed in 1944 the Mark I, which was a supercomputer at Harvard that helped design the atomic bombs. So Grace Hopper had an amazing ability to just take problems and turn those into mathematical equations and then turn that into machine language. In 1945, the US Army created this computer. It was designed to calculate trajectories. Uh, or, uh, the tra 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 sorry. English is not my native language, so some words are a little bit hard for me. So it, it was designed to calculate trajectories of weapons used by soldiers on the field. Uh, six women created and programmed this co and computer uh, because those six women were already doing the same calculations manually. It was easier for them to program it as well. But when this computer was introduced by the press, there, these women were almost not photographed or even mentioned. This was the only photo that was shown in the press with two women in, in, in it. And they actually look here more like uh, telephone operators. And in the 1960s, the computer industry was growing and getting more lucrative. And it was so lucrative that in 1967, the editor-in-chief of the Cosmopolitan decides to tell their readers about the healthy salary women will get in this line of work. And alongside it had photos of Anne Richardson here, uh, who was a systems IBM, an IBM systems engineer. Uh, she was wearing a sporty dress and pearly earrings, and she, that way she wanted to tell everyone that it was a job any woman could do. The article, st start, the article starts out with telling the readers that a girl senior system uh, analyst gets $20,000 and up. Now, in today's money, that's about $150,000 a year. So if you compare that to a uh, salary of a female secretary in New York, which was back then a relatively high-paying job in a very high-paying city, the average for that was about 5200 a year. So you could make almost four times as much as being a programmer. It also had a quote from Grace Hopper. And she said, it's just like planning dinner. It is something that uh, she said women are expert at because they have patience and attention to detail. Grace Hopper said, women are naturals at computer programming. Now, the wages, they were so extremely high because there were not enough programmers to fill these open jobs. But at the same time, the industry also started to shut women out. So companies were desperate to find new programmers. And recruiters began, to, uh, began working to find the skills and personality that was needed to become a good programmer. And at the same time, salaries went up, and program programming get, was getting a better status. In the beginning, it was seen as a typist job, but now it was becoming what they called a professional job, which was back then something masculine. And companies were using the IBM aptitude test. 
uh, that the test was uh, designed to test for problem solving skills. Um, but it was easy to cheat on that test. People were sharing the questions and answers. So they thought to start out with personality tests, something that was a little bit harder to cheat. And there were two mill psychologists, William Cannon and Dallas Perry, who profiled about 1,400 programmers to make a vocational interest skill. They believed that this could predict success in the field. But only 187 of those were women, which, if you, can, if you think of it, was really weird because the male-female ratio was almost 50-50 back then. And based on their studies, they found that well, good programmers are people that like solving puzzles. That makes sense. But they also shared one very specific trait. Programmers dislike activities involving close personal interaction. Now, you might think that's not something really focused on men. But uh, people be, were starting to get selected for being antisocial and not just for talent. It's, and that was the beginning of the now well-known stereotype of the seclusive developer. But it did favor male programmers more than female programmers. For example, antisocial personality disorder favors men by a three to one ratio. Autism and Asperger's was seen as high as seven times more in men. But besides that, women who have these characteristics are often seen as someone who doesn't like people, while men are seen as a lone wolf, which is something to be admired. So in his 2010 book, The Computer Boys Take Over, um, author Nathan Esmeringer wrote, the industry was selected for antisocial, mathematically inclined mills, and therefore antisocial and mathematically inclined mills were overrepresented in the programming population. This, in turn, reinforced the popular perception that programmers ought to be antisocial and mathematically inclined, and therefore mill. And once this progress got underway, every room related to computer science began to be filled with antisocial men. So classes, conferences, labs, and workplaces. And then they became senior programmers. They became bosses and they became teachers. And in the 1980s, when computers became normal to own at home, it became a boy thing, something to bond with a father and a son. And the stereotypical nerd was so wide, widespread, mid-80s movies like Weird Science, Revenge of the Nerds, and War Games romanticized the awkward geniuses who use a stack to win the affection, affections of attractive women. And even though popular media didn't create the stereotype, they definitely reinforced it. And in the mid-90s, there was a startup called Trilogy. Has anyone ever heard of Trilogy? Let's show of hands. I see one in the back. That's not a lot. OK, that's good. Then I have something to tell. Um, <laughs> so Trilogy was ran by a Stanford dropout called Joe Lehman. And after getting money from his investors for his software, he had an idea how to hire new programmers. And that is, his idea is something that's still visible in today's hiring strategies. So instead of hiring experienced programmers, he would take talented, overachieving students direct, directly out of graduation. The ethos of the company was, we're elite talent, and it's potential and talent, not experience, that has merit. Basically, they were looking for what they said, only the best. And to get those students, they passed out laptops in universities and hosted extravagant dinners at top restaurants in San Francisco. And most importantly, the recruiters were mainly young, good-looking women. The reason for that is that Joe Lehman had the idea to hire women that would never look twice at a geeky engineer. But once a student was interested in working for Trilogy, they had to undergo a series of brain teasers. And these kind of brain teasers might sound very familiar to you. They would ask them questions like, how many piano tuners are in the world? How many golf balls fit into a standard double-decker bus? And how much would you charge to wash all windows in San Francisco? And these are, this is a hiring strategy that was used by Google till 2013 and it's still being used by a lot of companies right now. But those questions, they have nothing to do with being a good programmer. These questions are only for a cultural fit. Because the company was looking for people with extreme confidence, people that would answer, answer these questions without any actual expertise. 
and the company culture was work hard, play hard. Holidays were called competitive advantage days because no one else was working. And at the end of the week, everybody was so tired, they were ready to party and let loose. And sometimes they would spontaneously hop on a plane to Vegas with Lehman himself, stay up all night and go to casinos and strip clubs. He expected his employees to bet all or nothing, sometimes even up to tens of thousands of dollars at a time. And these insane working hours, the drinking, the gambling, Vegas, strip clubs, etc., and valuing potential over expertise made the culture very male-dominated. It was completely hostile towards women. Now, Trilly was one of the first among a long line of tech startups that required assimilating into a culture of masculine arrogance that many people, especially women, might not want to sign up for. And in the past 20 years, much has changed, but the bro culture still exists. Two years ago, Susan Fowler shared her experience at Uber. She detailed the sexism and harassment she had faced at the company where she was a site reliability engineer. Her story where she told how managers and human resource department did little to rectify her issues showed how high, performance, high performers were protected when accused of harassment and other intolerable behavior. Now, Susan Fowler kind of brought Uber to its knees and it ignited the 2017 Me Too campaign. And many other women, including women in upper management at big companies, shared similar stories of harassment and sexism. But it's not over yet. There's still a lot of work to be done to make sure that everyone is treated equally. Now, this story has focused a lot on women in tech. But it's not just the women. It's also people of color, the LGBTQIA community, people with a disability, and people in economic and social hardships who are being marginalized and have to undergo a lot of harassment and discrimination. But what's the point of this when I'm saying, talking about this? My thing is, is how can you help with that by, how, by just being a better coworker? And also, what does all of this have to do with Lego? Nothing. Sorry. <laughs> A little bit. Lego, as everything Lego has to do with without being creative. But the Lego movie itself is also a lot about teamwork. And about how everybody is unique. And if you let everybody be their unique selves and value each other and believe in yourself as well, you can achieve great things. Much more than when everybody just follows a set of rules and lives in routines and conformity and is equal. And that is where the idea of this talk came from. I wanted to take that idea and see how we can put it into practice to create a more inclusive and welcoming environment. So this is actually the start of my talk. The address was all a very long introduction. Sorry for that. So a good way to start is to make everyone feel welcome and included. So onboarding new people is mostly just a simple to-do list. Just think about how you would onboard people at your company. I think it's a little bit of paperwork. You probably have some sort of Excel sheet or something that says what you need to do. It's, uh, uh, as a new person, you have to uh, write, write down some forms. You have to do some handshaking, forgetting everyone's name. Maybe you're meeting with some manager that tells you about the mission and vision of the company, which you probably don't even care about. But what's being left out here is to make you feel like you're actually part of this company, and that you, as an individual, feel welcomed. But it's not just something that you should do with new hires. Uh, making people feel welcome and included is something that is ongoing. But it does start out with new colleagues. When a new hire joins your company or your team, try to actively include them as much as possible. Because not everybody is going to be uh, comfortable with getting to know new people. And it's hard for them to reach out themselves. So think about your first day at the company you're currently working at and what you wished people did or told. And I know that when I started a new job, which is more often than I actually want to admit, but look at my LinkedIn profile and you notice, um, I, would, I would love to have an onboarding buddy. Something, someone that just helps me out the first few weeks with getting to know the new people, for me, that's least new. Uh, getting to know the company's culture and how everything works. Someone to 
make introductions for me uh, and to keep reminding me of everybody's name because I'm terrible with names. That's why I love these name badges that all of you are wearing. I hope that everybody would do that in company. Um, but uh, preferably it would also be someone who knows the code, but that's not extremely important. Um, it should be someone who tells me things proactively, like where to find certain documents and, uh, how, and who to ask for the things that I need. And someone who introduces me to other people at, at the lunch area or something like that. Um, but if your company doesn't really have onboarding buddies, or if they, they don't want to do this, um, you can still go to the new people and just uh, chat for a while. Could be about anything, could be about themselves, could be about how it's going. Just try to ask what problems they currently have just, and take an interest in their personal life. It makes them feel part of the company instead of someone who just kind of invaded a tight group of people. And when someone joins your team, remember that your whole team dynamic changes. Just think of it as forming an entire new team because everybody's gonna be communicating differently and working together just slightly different. So think of what would you do when you create a new team and how you would handle that. So maybe have a lunch together, do a brainstorm about priorities, something like that, and try to make sure that these new, new people are, uh, are feeling like an equal member. So try to avoid any inside jokes or talk about new features in the products that you haven't explained to them first. And don't assume that they will eventually learn because that's just going to exclude them and they will probably leave sooner than actually they want to. So for example, if a meeting is coming up uh, where there's gonna be a lot of talk about things that happened in the past or things that are going to happen in the future, talk to them a little bit beforehand and explain what's going on. Not just to make them feel welcome, but also that they can be uh, as valuable uh, for your company from, uh, from, from the very first day. So language is a, a tool that we try, uh, that we use to try and create a common understanding. It is powerful and it's essential for creating an environment where everyone feels welcome and included. But it's sadly also used to leave people out, to discriminate or marginalize. And this has been done for so long, it's becoming an unconscious habit. And it's such a habit that people actually disagree that some terms are excluding people. And to create a more inclusive environment, we need to take a look at these words and these phrases that we use and try to dig into empathy and imagine an experience that is not our own. There's some things I want to point out. Um, and some of those changes, they might seem a little bit unnecessary or maybe even silly, but I hope you would have an open mind. So first off, whenever you talk about some, uh, this is, by the way, very weird for me. I'm going to talk about language, English language, uh, to a bunch of people who probably know English a lot more than I do. So if I'm wrong, t please tell me. Um, so whenever you talk about someone, try to make your sentences people first. So instead of saying a blind man, use a man who is blind. Uh, this keeps the individual at the most essential element. Because if you say a blind man, you focus on the disability first, and you might unconsciously dehumanize them. You probably see uh, a man with dark glasses and a walking stick. But if you say a man who is blind, you will think of the man first before focusing on the blind part. It makes them a little bit more real. So it's very useful if you want to talk about accessibility or things like that. Um, jargon and abbreviations, they can exclude people who might not have specialized knowledge of a particular subject. And it can impede effective communication as a result. So try to use them uh, I try to only use the ones that are widely used. You can use things like SQL or PHP. You're not going to keep saying, what's it for? PHP hypertext process? It's going to be an endless loop anyway. So, um, so if ne necessary, explain what you, uh, what you mean. But uh, so if it's like uh, abbreviation that only is used in your company, try to explain what you mean. And if you give a presentation where it's being used, uh, try to uh, add the full phrase of, uh, of it on the slides it first comes up. 
And this is the one that I, I have people sometimes walking out of my talk because they don't really agree with me. But guys is not gender neutral. Uh, this is something that is being discussed a lot. And I'm, if you don't agree with me, that's fine. But people say that using guys instead of something like people, folk, or everyone is very normal. And yes, it is normal in the sense that a lot of people are using it like that. But using guys assumes that the normal default human being is a male. And although he or men are said to be neutral, there's numerous of studies that show that words like these cause people to specifically think of males. For example, when you talk about your user and you say he clicks on that button, you're going to unconsciously picture a man clicking on that button, which could then impact how you will, how you will design or write your code or your probably not your code, but your, uh, how you're going to design your application. So instead of he or she, try to use uh, the user. The user clicks the button. But also just with normal conversation. If you're, if you're going to do a presentation at your, your job and you keep referring your user as guys, then the women in your company might think, or the other, other people as well, they might think that you're just thinking of all your users as, as men. And uh, well, and instead of guys, you can also use people uh, things like people, folk, everyone, or I prefer y'all because it just sounds fun. <laughs> and I also hear people saying things like she's just a little bit OCD or bipolar, which is terrible. So, so terms like bipolar, OCD, and ADD, there are real psychiatric disabilities that people and maybe some of your coworkers actually possess. And this should not be used as metaphors for everyday behavior. Also, uh, terms that stem from context of mental health, like crazy or mad or schizo or psycho, uh, try to avoid these as much as possible. And all of these above also uh, counts when you're coding. Don't use the terms in your comments or in your commit messages uh, or your PRs. Don't use profanity that just makes you seem childish. And try to keep it as exclusive, uh, inclusive as, as possible. Just don't assume that just men are going to read your code. So another way to be an awesome coworker is to, by being humble and recognizing your own limitations and shortcomings. And being humble doesn't really mean to think less of yourself. It simply means to think of yourself less. And by doing so, you can help with making others feel more included. For example, knowing that you don't have all the answers right now might lead you to ask others for their input. And this signals to your colleagues that you're open to other ideas and to their ideas. So as I just said, the first step of being humble is by accepting your own limitations. And here's the hard truth. You're not the best at everything. You're probably not the best at anything. I know that I'm not. And nearly everyone knows things that you don't. And by accepting this, you can learn from everyone. You will become more empathetic and people will understand you better. And if you're not afraid of making mistakes and be honest about them, it also shows that the company doesn't have a culture where everyone has to be perfect. And this will relieve stress in you and in your colleagues and it opens up a lot of conversations. But to learn how this all works, we also need to listen to each other. And when someone listens to you, whether it's an idea you're sharing or a project challenge you're working on, it feels supportive to have someone all in, just witnessing what you're going through. So how many times do you bring your laptop to a meeting? I think for me, always, I used to always do that. Or maybe you're trying to tell something in a meeting or giving a presentation and everybody's just looking at their phone, which is very frustrating. The easier solution for this is also, uh, of course, you just do not bring your phone or laptop with you, but that's not always possible. Um, but if you don't, uh, if, you, if you have to bring them with you, but you don't really need all the notifications, try to turn all the email notifications and other channels off or just mute them and be there for your coworkers because they have uh, prepared a lot of effort into uh, preparing this meeting. So also look at people when they speak and try to make notes because that's also looks like you're more engaging. 
And if you don't understand what someone, what someone is saying, don't think that you are dumb or that everybody will think you're dumb. Just try to ask them to explain what was, what's going on. And also try to talk less and listen more. So don't interrupt someone or make corrections even if, they're, if, even if something is wrong. So you can make correction if, if something is wrong and that's really important to make the correction, but if it's just to show off how much you mo know, know more, just don't do that. Um, and maybe try a little bit more to understand someone else's viewpoints and be interested in what they have to say. Um, yeah, so it also goes the other way around. At meetings, there's also always one or two people that seem to dominate the conversations. They take the longest and, and have an opinion about ideas, about everything. This person could even be you. And these people are not bad people, but it could be that they make other people seem more insignificant. So in a recent study, a question was asked to employees at the global bank is when you have a contribution to make in a meeting, how often are you able to do so? And only 35% said that they felt they were able to make a contribution when they had something to add. And those other 65 mostly consists of four group of people. Uh, they're introverts, people who have an unconscious bias that someone who talks through information is smarter. Uh, but introverted people, they make their best contributions when they have some time to process and choose the words carefully. So while extroverts are talking, introverts remain quiet. And this might be seen as disengagement or lack of experience. And that will lead introverts of being demoralized. I will also tell you a little bit about how you can avoid these things. Um, I'm a remote worker at a company where no one else is remote, so I'm just constantly at home. And it's very hard to make a contribution via a conference call. If the connection is not perfect, it takes some time to process what the, other, what the person on the other line is saying, which can just lead to not saying any, anything at all. Um, a lot of studies have shown that women are far more likely to be interrupted and are taken less seriously. It is so common that there are terms like mentrupting and mansplaining, but I will not get into that for now. Um, and studies also show that there are often uh, people of color are often really ignored during meetings. Uh, they also need to work harder to be recognized and acknowledged than uh, more often than white uh, white coworkers. So, if you're the facilitator of a meeting, there are some things that you can do to make sure that everyone is valued equally. So before the meeting, uh, share the purpose of the meeting, the, share the presentations and any relevant data. That way, introverts can process some of the data before the meeting and they can ask additional questions during it. And it's also useful to help your remote workers to follow along. If you're working with video conferences, uh, ask the remote participants to use the chat feature to let everyone know that they want to chime in. Uh, Another way to, to include remote workers is to uh, have everyone use video. So what, what we do at our company is that everyone would just be with the headphones on and have the meeting on their own screens, which will help, well, at least for me, help me feel more included because everybody has the same issues. And try to set some ground rules, things like no talk, talking over each other and make sure that everyone keeps to it. When someone uh, interrupt someone else, say something like, I'm actually interested in what they had to say, so that people can actually talk a little bit more. And try to keep it central, no subgroups or talking when someone else has, has the floor. And after the meeting, send an email with a summary and the decisions and actions. This will help remote workers that might not have heard everything to, due to bad connections. But also do not forget about yourself, because you are awesome too. Being humble doesn't mean you should be quiet. You should but know your limit, uh, limitations, but also your strengths. Because your opinions are unique, and you are valid, and you should not be afraid to let your voice be heard. And it's very important to be aware of, because if you do not recognize your own awesomeness, it's hard to be a great coworker. Um, so find people who believe in you, and keep away the people who try to belittle your ambitions. Encourage and support them and welcome their support in return. Spend more time with those who sharpen you and make you better, and less time with those who drain your energy. Uh, the truth is, 
Friends and colleagues who speak encouragement into your life are priceless. And your opinions are valid, and you should not be afraid to let your voice be heard. Um, I stand up for what I believe in, and I think you should do too. And uh, sometimes people don't agree with you, which happens to me very often. But if you have surrounded yourself with people that share your viewpoints and who encourage you and support you, you, you will be less afraid to say what you believe because there are always people that will help you. But mostly, just be yourself. Uh, respect your coworkers and help them be themselves as well because uh, you're awesome and it's up to you to help make everything awesome as well. And this is a very terrible cliche. A little bit of kindness goes a long way. But it's a cliche, but it's also the core of this whole talk. If you want to have a more welcoming environment, people have to be kind to each other. And it will generate a ripple effect. If you start being more inclusive and kind to your coworkers, they will start doing the same to you and others as well.